Well, good morning or evening, afternoon, wherever, whatever time it is where you're at today here in Carolina, it's Sunday morning and it's a beautiful Sunday morning and wish we were getting ready to go to church, but we're still meeting remotely these days. Uh, I know a lot of states around us have opened up, but we're still lagging a little bit behind. Hopefully here in the next couple of weeks, we'll get back to meeting together and worshiping together and and, and fellowshipping and uh, I, we miss seeing everybody and for everybody there at grace that are tuning in well, we miss you can't wait to get back with you and all those churches that are around i'm sure you're feeling the same way but um, we want to try to continue the study and we'll do them as often as you can and i, I, I do want to apologize it's just been difficult to find the opportunity to sit down and to be able to put the study together and not feel rushed and not feel as if we're putting something together for the sake of putting something together and waiting on the leadership and the guidance of this Holy Spirit. And uh, so this morning we're going to follow him and uh, pray that God will be in the study and, and that there'll be continued help from it. We continue to thank you for the kind words and those that are, are tuning in. And, and if um, you have any suggestions, let us know. And if this is getting old, let us know and we'll stop if you're getting tired of hearing us and, or lo even looking at our face, which I would more understand. Um, but uh, we want to try to move forward. And so we're not going to go back and try to catch everybody up. We're going to move forward, but we're going to do very quickly on some things that you can know in an uncertain day. So if we begin our study this morning, we'll just recap a little bit on some things. We'll, we'll, let's read the scripture first and then we'll go back and recap. We're going to pick up in verse 20 and try to, we're going to read seven verses, but we certainly won't get to study all seven. It's going to take a little more time than what we allow here. But in 1 John 2, 20 and 27, it says, but you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. Now, here's what um, getting down to the nitty gritty. We're trying to study things that we can know for certain out of first John. And he says we can know all things. Uh, we'll explain that a little bit more here in just a minute. So don't think that uh, all of a sudden after this study, you're going to know everything you're going to need to know about being a Christian, about God, about walking in the light and being a daily conversation and in fellowship. No, 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 no. That's not what it means. Verse 21, and I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it and that no lies of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Christ or Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledged the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But watch in verse 27, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. These are very heavy scriptures and very deep, and we're going to try to break them down and go just as smoothly and as slowly as we can to try to expound upon them because we live in an uncertain day in an uncertain world and we're uncertain of our of our leadership in the in the government our leadership in the church but and by the way i've seen these things on the internet but do pray for your pastor he's never led a congregation through a pandemic like this before we're all trying to figure this thing out together what is best for the for the general population and then what is best for the congregation as well we certainly wouldn't want to be responsible for um, bringing sickness into someone's home in the name of fellowship having churches completely outside of the building i mean you can have church you can worship anywhere anytime 
but we, when we can, we're to assemble ourselves together and we should, but I would not want to meet my maker knowing that out of pride we met or out of defiance we met together and brought illness sickness and death even into one home so let's move forward so what can we know let's review chapter one real quick we can know that we can have fellowship with jesus if we believe on his name we know that we can have joy in the midst of the storm the trial the trouble the darkness we can still be joyful knowing that it's going to come to an end at one down whether it be here or there we're going to have joy we also um uh, you see, we before the beginning that he was before the beginning. He was in the beginning. He was the beginning of our hope. The Lord has a plan for his children. Nothing is by accident. We can know that for certain. If, we're, if he brought us to it, he'll bring us through it. Jesus is the light, the light that we should walk in his light. And there's the problem is that sometimes we walk afar from him. And we don't reflect the light as strongly as we could if we were walking closely to him. And still in chapter one, it, um, it reminded us again that even though we're saved, even though we're a Christian, even though we're bound for heaven, our names written down, covered in the blood, we still have the capability of sinning. As a matter of fact, we still do sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we sin and if we confess that uh, sin, he's faithful to forgive us that sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and restore us again into fellowship. As we moved into chapter two, we learned that we can know him. And I mean, know him by living with him daily, by conversing with him daily and listening to him daily. We also know that we are in him. John chapter uh, 10 says that we're in his hand. He's in the hand of the father and no man's going to pluck us out. We know that these are the last days. Now, I know they've been saying that ever since John wrote this first epistle and or Peter in his day, Paul in his day. But these are the last days. And you say it's been thousands of years. Yeah, but in heaven, it's just a little while. When you say that it's eternal day there, this is just a little while. These are the last days. We can know that we are of the congregation. He said some of them went out from us, but they really weren't of us. <coughs> they came to church. They dressed the part. They talked the talk, but they did not walk the walk. And they went out from us and began to deceive and began to bring shame into the name of Christ. And he says, we also can know the Antichrist. Now, listen, the Antichrist is not something that's just in the future. The spirit of Antichrist has been on this earth from day one when Satan first stepped foot down here and began to tempt Eve. The spirit of Antichrist was that that was in, in Judas. He said he was the son of perdition from the very beginning. And by the way, that did not keep him from walking after Christ, but he did not walk with Christ. He was always the son of perdition. And we can know the spirit of Antichrist. And then we're going to look today just kind of what is Antichrist. If you go back now to verse 18, he says, little children, this is the last time. And we have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So one of those things we can know that the pestilence, the plagues and the, the sin, the darkness, all that's surrounding us now, the trials, the tribulations, death and destruction. These are all just things that are on, on the, I don't want to use the word signs, but they've always been around. And these are the last days. This earth is not getting better. It's not getting bigger. It's not getting cleaner. It's got not getting any less populous. It's on a constant decline that came from the moment that sin entered into the garden and then that sin entered into mankind. We, we've been dying all along from the moment we're born and draw our first breath. We're dying, so to speak. We have one end that is common to us all and that death, there is an appointed death. There is a day that's on already on the schedule. God knows all about it when we will meet our death. We're but. These are the last days. I mean, this, uh, he, Jesus is coming soon. Now, and whether that means soon to me or soon to him, he's coming soon. And we can know that, that, that there are plenty of people who are in the spirit of Antichrist in these last days. And he's speaking again to us, his little children. 
those who are and the reason that he says little children here is that when you first become a Christian or when you're young in Christ, you can be more or you should be more easily led astray. I, and I'm surprised that some of those that have been on the path for a long time sometimes become easily led astray. They try something new or they follow after some man or after some doctrine and then they find themselves uh, far from God and, and in judgment. So he's speaking to the little children, say, here, let me try to teach you how to understand and know when someone's trying to deceive you or when the spirit of Antichrist has come. And it um, now the Antichrist is just anyone who's anti-Christ, who are trying to point into another direction, into another faith and into another way of uh I don't even want to say worshiping, because if you're not worshiping the one true living God, what are you really worshiping? I mean, there's no interaction there. There's no um, there's no help and there's no guidance. There's no peace. So he says, listen, you have an unction from the Holy One and ye know all things. Now, what he's talking about here is when you are saved and you're truly giving your heart to Christ, it says the Holy Ghost of God comes to live within your heart. And through the Holy One that abides in us, if we will pray to and God and if we will listen to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and if then we will follow after the Spirit, we have everything that we'll need to know. We'll know what we need when we need it. One of the illustrations that I always use is that there's no need to carry around tools that you don't need to use at the time. They become cumbersome. They become burdensome. They, you don't need them, and soon you put them aside because you get tired of carrying them around. Uh, most of you know I went to school to be a history major, and I, I enjoy history, and especially the Civil War period of the U.S. history and <coughs> in the beginning the uh, the very first days of the war, the Union troops were issued full complement of uniform. It included long sleeve wool, overcoats, um, <clears throat> all the things they would need to get through the winter. The problem was, is it was late August, September, and it was hot. And as they were marching and as they were going about and ready and preparing for uh, the first bull run of Manassas, it got cumbersome, it got burdensome, and they'd done away with those things that they didn't need to carry around. Problem is, when it started getting cold later on, they didn't have the things they need. It's not like that with God. He's not going to put things on you that you don't need at the moment. Grace will be sufficient. When you come to a trial, when you come to a situation, whatever you need, whether it's a kind word for a hurting neighbor or whether it's a word for hurting yourself, he'll give you what you need when you need it. You won't have to carry it around. It won't become cumbersome or burdensome. He'll give it to you as you need it. And that is the way the Holy Ghost works in your heart. He gives you what you need when you need it. And we have an unction. Well, now, what does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. Well, let me, let me say this first. It doesn't mean you automatically know everything and that you've got a degree in theology and that you, you, you will have a complete understanding of the scriptures. I'm telling you, I've been on this road a long time. And as I need it, the scriptures become alive to me. I can read a scripture and it'll mean one thing when I need it then. And it'll mean a second thing when I need it then. And I'll grow and I'll learn. And each time I read it, I'll learn something new. But, but one thing I do know, and this, this whole series is about what you can know. The more, one thing I do know is the longer I go, the less I know. <laughs> it's new every day. And that's why it says, it's why Paul said it this way. Behold, we become new creatures. Behold, all things are new. That doesn't mean just at that moment of salvation. That means every day, all things are new. We're, <laughs> it's, it's such a wonderful life to be a Christian and to have that peace. We're taught by the Father and the strong. Remember the last lesson, he was writing to the fathers and the young and the strong in the church and this little children. But it's, it's about but, you know, when you're out on your own and you don't have the fathers and you don't have the strong and you don't have someone to turn to physically, 
Who do you turn to? You turn to the Holy Ghost that lives within your heart and you have an unction from the Holy One. And what does that mean? Unction. Well, there you go. We'll go back to the blackboard. And in this particular case, we'll use the New Bible Dictionary. It gave one of the better definitions and descriptions in our study software as we were <coughs> looking around at the different definitions of the word unction. It's charisma, unction, anointed. And it's the indwelling Holy Ghost of God, something that that comes upon us and something that dwells within us and rises to the occasion when we need him. It, it, it leads us. It guides us. It keeps us on the straight and narrow. And he makes all things known to us. We may not understand it today, but when we need it. When we're in the position where we need it the most, he'll make us to understand it. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. He said, you couldn't understand it if you tried. Even if I wanted you to know all things, you couldn't understand it until the experience comes. Verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now there's that last little bit of that. What are the deep things of God? Those are the things that that you could read a million times, you could have the instruction book, you could follow the manual, but until you have to walk through it, until you have to experience it, whether it's the heartache, the heartbreak, the separation that death brings, whatever the trial is, financial, I know there are a lot of people hurting right now, haven't worked in weeks, haven't gotten any um, unemployment, haven't gotten any assistance. I mean, it's getting hard, but I promise you the spirit of God will make these things known to you and understand the deep things of God, why they happen. We may not understand completely why. All you got to do is go back to Job and you'll see Job search all through those uh, chapters to understand why. But if you look, he questions he doesn't understand, but yet uh, the entire time he has peace about it that God will reveal to him in the last day. And, and I love it. He says, yet in my flesh, I shall see. Even if he kills me in my flesh, I will see God. So let me give you this example. And uh, boy, I thought I fixed that. Um, it's an illustration that's it's common. And, and I understand it because I walked through it myself. As a young preacher and as a young man, you feel like you know everything. I mean, you, you, you've got complete understanding of God. You've got complete understanding of the scriptures, you know, and you're going to teach the world what you found out. And especially as a pastor, you figure you know what's good for everybody when you first start out. But as you go along, you realize that uh, you might not know as much as you thought you did. Then you go a little longer and you realize I definitely didn't know as much as I thought I did. And as you go a few more years on, you understand completely you don't know nothing. All you can do is share that unction that the Holy Ghost has put inside of you. There was a young preacher. He was still in seminary, still looking for that divinity degree, which uh, for those of you that have it, yeah, I, I, I have a great respect for your commitment. And But it's not about the degree. It's not about a piece of paper that you hang on the wall. And it's not about putting doctor in front of your name. If you don't have the unction of the Holy Ghost, that piece of paper don't mean nothing. If you don't have the indwelling Holy Spirit of God in your preaching and in your teaching and in your ministry, what have you got? What help are you to the, to the congregation? Uh, anyway, this young preacher still in seminary, he would spend his weekends, he'd gained a little reputation as being an eloquent speaker and a knowledgeable individual. And, and he would go traveling around and, and preaching on the weekends. And he said one weekend he preached six services. He preached four on one Sunday. And uh, these were back early days when times were, were hard. And at the end of the day, his, his offering added up to a little over a dollar and fifty cents. And he was kind of feeling down. He was, he was kind of wondering what in the world was going on. And, and he was searching God. But it was back in the days when after church, folks would go over to someone's house and have dinner. Uh, I remember many days um, going to dinner on the ground or going down to uh, 
we called her Mama Old Tucker's house. She lived just down below the church. And by the way, in this day where everybody's wearing face masks and gloves and stuff, we all washed our hands out of the same wash basin, drank out of the same dipper out by the well, and none of us died. Uh, but that was a different day, a different era, where folks were a little cleaner maybe than we are now. But uh, we would go down and have, you know, it wasn't uncommon. And this preacher was invited over to have dinner with grandma. And grandma had a big house full of people. And uh, now one of them had made mention that grandma had grown up hard. She was a pioneer and settled the area, but she never did learn to read. And someone said, well, why don't you read a little scripture to grandma? She would enjoy that. And the preacher in his arrogance and the preacher in his youth and the <laughs> enthusiasm began to read John 14 to her. And as he went on feeling good about himself and trying to expound upon his great knowledge that he'd been given through his studies, grandma began to rock in her chair. And then after, when he was done, she said to him, now, have you ever considered this? And she began to explain to him the deeper things of God that was in John 14 that he had never learned in school, never learned in Sunday school, never learned at the seminary and did not understand. And pretty soon the teacher became the pupil and that grandma began to teach this young man about having the unction of the Holy Spirit and how that it's more about living this life of Christianity than it is having a head knowledge of this life of Christianity. And as they were traveling back to the seminary to start their uh, studies back up on Monday, he and his traveling partner began to understand that there's much more to this, much more to this than having an education. You must have the Holy Spirit and then have the unction about you to be able to follow after him. Let me give you a personal example of that. And um, this is for most of my family that will be tuning in. I use some pictures. I apologize ahead of time if, if I didn't gain your permission. But it goes to the point, And I think you'd be proud of, of our heritage. So what are you talking about? Well, let me introduce you to my grandmother and grandfather. They are Charlie and Greta Stanley. They um. I am where I am today because of that little lady right there. Now, it, there's a combination of many people. I had good grandparents on both sides. I have a big extended family. They taught us the, the way to go. And But what I mean by that is spiritually. I don't know that uh, Grandma ever did take a Bible and beat anybody over the head with it to try to get them to God. But I know she prayed. I know she prayed over her boys. I know she prayed over her girls. And they had a bunch of them. Matter of fact, let me show you a picture. Here are some, the two oldest boys aren't in this, but, the, you know, they grew up like everybody else in the mountains, I guess, in those days, just hardworking folks getting by the best you can. I remember somebody telling us that, uh, or not telling us, but an illustration said, you know what, I grew up the richest man on earth. I had good brothers, good sisters, good parents. And I didn't know we were poor until somebody came by and told us we were poor, that we didn't have any money and that we didn't have a lot of things. She knew more about God, having the unction of the Holy Ghost in her than most people do who have gone to seminary and who have gained a great education. One of my fondest memories are her going around the side of the hill towards the barn with the old bucket and a stool and about 10 cats going to milk in the evening and, and uh, milking and, and singing and, and the old songs, the old gospel songs. I was privileged many times to be able to hold the tail of the cow while she milked to keep it from swatting around uh, or, or sitting out on the back porch stringing beans or, or, or or churning in the evening and hearing that churn get that rhythm and then hear that song come out. You didn't have to wonder whether or not she had a doctorate in the front of her name. You didn't have to wonder whether or not she'd read the Bible from cover to cover. You didn't have to wonder whether or not she had some great education concerning the Bible. You could see beyond a shadow of a doubt she knew the Lord. She not only knew the Lord, but she had the spirit about her to understand. She could get Oh, she was sharp. I mean, she she was sharp-witted, but she also had kindness and understanding. 
She could also pull a piece of kindling out from behind the wood stove and wear your tail out. But she was a kind woman who, who, who through her actions, through her life, inspired me and taught me about God. That's what I mean when I say I am where I am today. You could not have led me down a path. You could not have forced this upon me. But when my time came and the Spirit of God convicted my heart, having seen the, the God through her, I knew that it was real. I knew that it was positive. The hard times, the hardships. Uh, she lost a child when he was just very young. Matter of fact, a twin to one of those that were there now. Um, her life inspired me. And so when my time came, when the Holy Ghost presented himself and asked me to follow Jesus, I knew that what by watching her, that this thing was real and, and it made it so that I could not only accept Christ and become a Christian, but that that same spirit that filled her, that same spirit that fills many of the family today, that same spirit now fills me. And through that unction, now I don't have a divinity degree and I don't think I'm too old. I can't go back to school. If anything new comes in this side, something old has to come out this side. I'm just, my head is full. But um, that unction, that spirit, I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world. Dr. Oliver, he's doctor. But Oliver B. Green said, all that I gained in seminary, I wouldn't trade for anything for what I learned on my knees before a holy and a righteous God. It's about being filled with that spirit and having that unction. You don't have to feel bad that you don't have the best of everything. You don't have to feel um infringed or, or, or um, you don't have to disenfranchised you don't have to feel like you've been slighted in any bit if you've got the holy ghost of god you've got all you'll ever need to get you through this life and into that that's to come so we've said all that to say this in verse 21 i have not written to you because you know not the truth but because you know it, if you've got the Holy Ghost of God in your heart, you've got all you need to have a complete and full understanding and knowledge of what's real. You can know him. You can know peace. You can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that in these darkest days, there's a light yet to come at the end of the tunnel. You can walk in his light. He says, I'm writing to you not because you don't know these things, but just to encourage you and remind you that you do know these things now we're going to stop right there and we'll pick up here on our next study i hope it's been a blessing and um we're praying for you we're looking forward to getting back into church services with you but until then god bless you stay safe and we'll see you in the next study